Hey. Okay. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Kitzur Shulchan Aruch class, the Bridge Code of Jewish Law. Except we're going to take a brief step out. Uh, well, depending on how many questions, it might be the whole lesson. Who knows? But we're oh, going to discuss oh, Hanukkah. Oh. Now we'll give everyone a uh, a see if they can guess why we might be doing Hanukkah today. Okay, it's because this week. But other than that, that's that. You know, there's no reason other than that. Okay, so we have starting Thursday night Hanukkah. So let's have a quick review of the laws of Hanukkah. So Hanukkah begins on the twenty fifth day of the Jewish month of Kislev. So uh, when the Christians stole everything and and messed it all up, not only they took the festival of lights and instead of lighting menorah, they called their festival of lights and lit, I don't know, make the uh, energy grids go offline because there's so many lights on their house and different things. Well, they even made it on the 25th, just the wrong month, right? 25th of December. Well, it's actually 25th of Kislev. That is when we have. So what happened? So the, the cut a long story short, Alexander the Great um, passed away and there were, his kingdom sort of divided into four, really. I mean, you had in Greece itself, but we're not going to count them. But there were three whose, whose territory overlapped parts of the Middle East, three generals. And two joined up together and uh, got rid of the third. And then you ended up having the Ptolemies who were um, based in Egypt and had the Seleucids who were based in Syria. And of course, anyone who knows the map, knows right in between those two places, is Israel. So they fought all their wars in Israel. Now the Ptolemies had Israel initially. Now the Ptolemies were relatively speaking... Um, they weren't. They didn't force any. Um, they weren't trying to force the Jewish people to, to, uh, to assimilate. They felt let's just offer the good life, and the Jews will assimilate on their own. And unfortunately, that is what happened to a certain extent. And quite possibly, if that would have continued, you know, who knows what would have happened? You know, similarly, as we, we seem unfortunately Jewish people. As soon as life gets good, we see it and. In America and other places, the Western world in a modern time, you know, where uh, as soon as life is good and we come and they make a back, there's a lot of people who unfortunately um, uh, find keeping Judaism too difficult and uh, they look for, for other paths. But that was uh, that's what happened. And then after a war between the Ptolemies and the Syrian based ones, the Syrian Greeks. The Syrians won, and they had uh, Antiochus, right? So his his nickname that he called himself was like the Great One, but a small little change of a letter in a Greek makes the insane one, and that's what everyone else called him, including his own people. Right? So he was an absolute madman, and um, he didn't have patience the Jews to uh, assimilate, and he decided Rabbi, to force them. Yes. How did the Syrians come to the Greeks and vice versa? Well, because Alexander he conquered the all the way till you know almost India. Oh, oh. Okay. So, so his generals after he died, his generals divide. Well, they didn't they didn't sit down to divide up the territory. They all had a mad rush who could take it over. So one general. He was based in Syria. That's where he had his. Uh, that's where he had himself. So um, they went into the base of Mikdash. They put up an idol. They made it a temple to Apollo, and they uh, that wasn't the spaceship, by the way. It wasn't to worship the spaceship, but uh, they um, they made the band the Jewish calendar using the Jew use of the Jewish calendar, Ben Shabbos, the study of Torah, uh, having a bris. Uh, that's what, that's, they came down pretty hard. 
And so Jewish people who wanted to keep mitzvahs ended up going out to the mountains outside the cities and to little villages outside the cities. But slowly, slowly, uh, soon they came to a, a city, a t- little village, we should say, Modin. There's a, there's a Jewish town there today, city there today. One of my sons learned in Yeshiva there, actually. Modin Elite, and that's like the upper Modin. And, um, but anyway, that's, that's, <coughs> they went there and they, uh, brought their statue, their idol, and told the townspeople to offer a pig to the idol. Um, and the Jewish people wouldn't, but there's always someone who, for the right incentive, unfortunately, uh, was willing to do it. And so Matissio uh, killed him. They caused a, a battle. They killed the soldiers who were there. And uh, that became his battle cry. Whoever is for Hashem, join with me. And that became the beginning of the revolt against the Greeks. Uh, they're known as the Maccabees. Um, play on words. It's an abbreviation for who is who is like Hashem. And because they realized, you know, this is Hashem's uh, a revolt. We're stopping. You know, we can't let we can't let let our spiritual values be destroyed. And it also uh, play on words made like hit with a hammer. That was that was what also translated as. And they began guerrilla warfare. But really, it was an absolute miracle. He essentially had farmers, untrained farmers. Uh, Defeated a, the, a much larger, I'm talking about five times to ten times larger army, uh, with with armor, properly you know weapons, trained, so uh, it was a miracle. Of course, um, they finally came into the base of Mikdosh, and um. So someone else came in. They came into the base Mikdash, and they cleaned it. One thing that they couldn't repair was the altar. They had to take it apart, and um, they buried it. They built a new altar. <coughs> they came to relight the menorah, and everyone knows the story, of course, that um, they the the Greeks allowed the lighting of the menorah. Right? They they had no problems with people keeping traditions. But it had to be a tradition and nothing spiritual. So therefore, they they contaminated. They made Tome all the oil because what's Tuma and Tahara? What's this uh, spiritually uh, uh, conducive and not conducive of things? You know, which is, this is, they, that, that's what they were against. Let's take, let's take the God out of the Judaism. You want to have a nice culture? No problems. You know, can, uh, you can, you can, you can eat gefilte fish just like an Italian eats spaghetti, but don't make it don't make it religious. You know that was don't make it spiritual. That was their uh, that was their idea. And of course they searched. They found buried one small jug. It was on the fa- for one day, stayed for eight days, and that's what happened. So, um, Hanukkah, the, yeah. Rabbi. A yeah. quick question. Yeah. So Alexander the Great Greek was a person that was beneficial to the Jews, and then had, to a certain extent. To an extent, no? yeah, yeah. So, so where what happened between that and the final Greek Syrians becoming uh, the bad guys? Okay, so Alexander he, well, so, so mentioning already. So there's there's the uh, the Talmud recounts so that the Samaritans came to him. And said, uh, you know, the uh, the Jews are your enemy because he he was conquering the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great. And they said, you know, the uh, the the they they were loyal to the Persians. They're your enemy. Go wipe them out. So Alexander was on his way to Yerushalayim to God forbid to destroy the temple. So uh, the kind Godel came out in his clothes, the whole uh, kind of the uniform. And when Alexander saw him, he got off his horse and he and he bowed down. And the soldier go, what's going on over here? 
Uh, so he says every time he goes into battle, he sees uh, an image of this man leading him into victory. And uh, anyway, they made a peace agreement. They uh, agreed to a lot of Jewish contracts uh, dated by the the king. You know, this this many years of the rule of the king. So they agreed they're going to use from Alexander's reign. And every child born that year was going to be called Alexander. That's, by the way, that's how it became a Jewish name. See a lot of people called Sender, all these various names like that. That's uh, a Yiddish version of Alexander. That's that's how it got into the um, the uh, the Jewish naming. People then started naming after the Zeta. You know, every boy that born that year was called Alexander, and uh, they agreed to pay taxes and various things. And um, Alexander was a person who uh, he he was a student of of all subjects, we'll say. So he also was interested in studying Torah, some of the ideas. Doesn't mean he was a great guy, you know. At the end of the day, he went around um, killing anyone he could for his own power. Uh, but he 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 wasn't bad per se. But then we had this clash clash of cultures, you know. It's it's like everything the Greek culture valued was like the, the opposite of what we value. You know, um, materialism, you know, hedonism, just uh, pleasure for pleasure's sake, indulgement, uh, promiscuity, was really uh, a clash of values. And that's sort of what led to the war. You ended up having a... Because the Greeks, everywhere else they went, they, they the people followed them and took on their culture. Um, and none of the Jews sort of stood there stubbornly. And, and this uh, Antiochus got on his nerves, essentially. He, was, he, he, just, he just couldn't take it. These people defying our values. Um, that happened. You know, just... While we're mentioning about Alexander, you know, just to give an idea a little about his person, you know, one one place he went to, he conquered one place, and uh, all right, so the king, no, he paid taxes to him, and this king was known to be very wise. This wasn't a Jewish king, but uh, so Alexander, you know, sat in his court to uh, to hear see how how did this person judge his his country. So a case came. A fellow had sold some land to someone else. Uh, and this one who purchased the land started to uh, dig to whatever improvements he wanted to make on the land. And he found buried a treasure chest. So he went back to the, uh, the person he bought it from. He says, look, I only paid for the land. I didn't pay for the treasure. Here's your treasure back. And the fellow says, uh, "Treasure, it's, it's not, it's not mine. You keep the treasure." So each one's saying, "You take the treasure." Now you take the treasure. So they ended up going to the king for judgment. So the judgment says to one of them, "says You have a son, right?" He says, "Yeah." And the other one, "You have a daughter, right?" "Yeah." It's all right. Let let the son and daughter marry, and the treasure will be theirs. And that's what this king decreed. And Alexander watches. He says, if I would have been the king here, I would have killed them both and taken the treasure for myself. Right? So just, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure. He, he wasn't negative in that he didn't destroy anything in the Jewish world physically. But I, I don't think I'm a, um, you know, a saint by, by, by any means. So with the Menorah, so we had several miracles here. We had the miracle, the military victory. We had that they even found the jug of oil, and we had that the oil lasted. So therefore, we have different observances. For the for the military victory, we say halal every day in, in Hanukkah. We say halal, a praise. It's uh, halal is uh, except for the Exodus of Egypt, which Hashem, we you know, we we say halal for. Other than that, it's only a great miracle for the entire Jewish people in the land of Israel. So, uh, so we say halal for the great miracle. We say the the 
uh, blessing is not the right word, but it's called prayer called Al Hanisim, which recounts the story briefly and thanks Hashem for the miracles. We say that in the Shmon Esra, the Amida, and we also say it in benching in the grace after meals. And then for the miracle of the lights, of course, we like the menorah. And that's um that's 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 what we do. So it's called Hanukkah. What does Hanukkah mean? There's two main meanings. One is Chanu, and then the letters Kof Hay. So Chanu means they rest, we rested, or we were tranquil, maybe a better word, we were relaxed on the 25th. Right, because this is when we got back. You know, we we won on the twenty fifth of Kislev when we were back. That's one meaning, and the other meaning, Hanukkah is like Hanukkah, like like a, a dedication. So when someone moves to a new house and they, I guess I don't I don't want to call it a housewarming party, but because it's meant to be, you know, when you put up the mezuzah and you, you know, you have a, you thank Hashem. It's called Hanukkah Sabayis, the dedication of the house. So it's that same word. So, because uh, they rededicated the the altar that they could have the uh, the the offerings again. Um, so that's that's the name. Uh, we're not allowed to fast on Hanukkah, and as a matter of fact, uh, we should have meals a little bit nicer meals, and we should sing songs or and or tell the story of the miracles of Hanukkah and we turn this meal into a Sudas mitzvah, a mitzvah meal by by making a mitzvah praise to Hashem. Now it's it it's not a yantiv in the respect that you can't do malacha, you can't do the the work that you can't do on Shabbos and and the say sukkahs or Pesach. You're allowed to do malacha. However, there's a custom that women do not do malacha the half hour of the menorah. The reason for this, well, there's several reasons. One reason that was a, a big miracle happened through a lady. I'll tell that next. But the other, the other reason is that unfortunately, part of the Greek decrees was that when a couple married, the bride had to go her first night to the Greek governor, and only then could she go to her husband. So the 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 oppression was worse for the women, and therefore um, uh, they observe the miracle in a greater way. So uh, while the menorah is lit, or at least for the minimum half hour that the menorah needs to be lit, so women don't do any malacha. Right, the husbands have to do the laundry and stuff. Not uh, make the husbands work instead. Okay, so that's that's one reason we said the the miracle, the, the saving happened through a, a lady. So what happened was that there was a lady named Yehudas, and she was from uh, the Hashmonoi family. She was related to the Maccabees. So this was after they had the initial victory. So that they got the Menorah. The, the Menorah. So what happened is that the Greeks. Came back, right? They kept fighting for quite a few years after this, and uh, one of the 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 battles afterwards, they came. They besieged Jerusalem. So uh, she went out with her. Um, anyway, she went out, and she says to the she meets the Greek general Elifornus, and she says to him, uh, "I'm going to show you a secret passage into into Yerushalayim, aren't she?" She told the guards, I'm here to show them. And you know, they take it to the king. She says, she's only going to tell the general. She goes to the general. And uh, he, she, got, she says she's going to show him in the morning, in the daylight. But she'd like to entertain him tonight. She was very attractive, was quite excited. She brings out her little basket with a very salty cheese. And he eats the cheese. Because of this, some people are accustomed to eat some dairy foods on, uh, on Hanukkah. So she eats, he feeds it. Feeds him the cheese, and um, he's very thirsty. She also brought some very strong wine, and so he washed down with the wine. And soon he's out; he's totally drunk. He's passed out, and then she um, cut off his head. 
And she, uh, she actually, one of the things she arranged was that she should have right of way to go through, the, go in and out of the camp without um, guards stopping her because she told Eliphonus that because of the idols there, she needs to go outside to pray. So he had, all the guards were, were given the order that she can go in and out. And she put the head in the picnic, picnic basket. You know, it's called the decapitation diet, right? He lost uh, 20 pounds instantly. But that's, uh, so they, she she goes back out and they hang his head on the walls of Jerusalem. In the morning, all the soldiers wake up and what do they see? The general's head hanging there and they freak out and they run. And so that, that was the end of the siege. So it's a combination of those two reasons, that the persecution was worse for the women and that Yehudas did this uh, incredible thing. And therefore, uh, women don't do malacha while the menorah is lit. Okay. So, what actually is the mitzvah of lighting menorah? So, the mahadrin min mahadrin, the best of the best, right? The absolute best way to do it is we light one candle the first night, uh, second candle the second night, three the third night, so on and so forth, till we have eight on the eighth night. Um, ideally, it should be with olive oil, because olive oil is what happened, the miracle happened with. So it's uh, it's in recognition of the, of the miracle. So ideally, we should have it with, with olive oil. That's, that's the primary reason. Uh, if olive oil is not available, it could be any oil or any candle, anything that has a nice light. Because uh, once we're using candles, the most preferred candle is beeswax. Uh, if you can get them, and there's some people uh, who use oil, many people use uh, beeswax for the shamash, for the servant candle, which we'll speak about um, shortly. So we, uh, every person is obligated, every member of the household is obligated to light the menorah. The custom is that uh, married women go with their husband. They don't light their own. The husband lights both of them. And um, because of that, there's different customs about unmarried ladies. So some do light and some, many people, most people probably don't light the ladies unless they're the only ones in the house because uh, when they get married, they're going to stop and it's not good to start and stop and stop and start. And, um, and so the, the married couple like one unit. So because of this, there is a custom in many communities that the at the at the marriage or during the engagement, the um, the bride or her family buy a menorah for the groom as a gift. So that way, that's like that's how they share the mitzvah. He lights it, but she provided the menorah. You know, it's like similarly, similarly, uh, many most people have a custom that the groom and all his family uh, purchase Shabbos, the Shabbos candlesticks for the for the bride. So even though she's lighting, he also has a share in the mitzvah because they're using the, anyway, that's, that's the uh, general custom. Now we can't, we can't have a benefit from the light of the menorah. So today we have electric lights, but in the past it was problematic. So um, people would light a shamash. It's usually a little bit higher like a servant candle. And that's the one whose light, we, we if we get got any benefit or from that light. Many people also double up and use the shamash to light all the other candles from. Because um, you're not meant to light one of the mitzvah candles from another one. You could if there's nothing else, but it's best not to. So that's the, um, that's the idea. So they said the best thing is to use olive oil. Um, now, you have to have enough oil. Enough oil means that it's going to go for at least half an hour, or enough wax in the candle, going to go for at least half an hour after nightfall. So that will change depending where you are. Nightfall generally is it's the time the Shabbos comes out, you could say. Um the Shabbos finishes, so, you know, to total three stars, and three stars, three average stars come out. So sh so even if you light it a bit before that, and on Friday, before Shabbos, we have to light uh, almost an hour before that. So you have to have enough oil 
that'll go, it'll keep burning until it's dark, and then at least half an hour after dark. Um, and even though you could use anything, but you shouldn't use something that has a bad smell. Like you shouldn't use like kerosene, something like that, because it you know it smells. It's not respectful for the mitzvah. Um, wicks. Uh, so the idea wicks, uh, cotton wool. Use cotton. Um, that's the ideal, if you can. Uh, you don't have to use new wicks every day. If you actually pour in the oil and put the wicks, you know, if you're getting ready-made ones, either candles or oil containers, and obviously there's a, there's a new wick in each one. But if you put in the oil yourself, as long as the wick is in good enough shape, you can use the same wick. Uh, the menorah should be nice. So in the ideal world, people should use a silver menorah. Now, ideal world, we don't always live in the ideal world. Who can afford, not everyone can necessarily afford a silver menorah. Some people are silver plated, some people are something else. You know, well, same thing, Shabbos candles ideally should be silver. You know, my my grandmother, my father's mother, she had a brass. Right? So it was a brass Shabbos candlesticks. And uh, my my grandfather had a brass menorah. That's, that's, that was the times so people couldn't afford silver. I, I'm not sure what they had when they first got married. You know, they were, they were in England during the war and the house got bombed. And uh, they had nothing, right? Everything they owned was destroyed. Um, but at least after that, bro. So I'm not, I don't know if they had something else before or not. Um, but in the ideal world, as you said, we should have silver, silver, without going into it cabalistically. That's it's there's uh, uh, silver represents a very high spiritual level. That's why also silver kiddush cups. Um, you know, anything we use for a mitzvah in the ideal world should be silver. It's actually silver. For a mitzvah, is even better than gold or anything like any other precious metal. So silver is the ideal, but the main thing it should be nice. You know, it should be the best that 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 one can use. You know, there was a uh, a very very wealthy man uh, that he used to use um, potato, at least for one of the lights every year. He used to, he carved out a potato, and um, so a whole story. He he. You know, he collapsed. They called Hatzala, you know, the Jewish uh, ambulance, and and they came and they stabilized him. And then before they took him to hospital, he wanted to light menorah, and they saw that he lit this potato, and uh, was was uh, you know they had this incredibly expensive menorah as well, and obviously from the house, this man was a very successful man, and so afterwards the Hatzala, the, the Hatzala volunteer he came by and he just he asked uh, he doesn't mean to pry. But he's curious, you know, what's what's with the potato? So he told them as the family was running from, uh, in the Holocaust, was running from the Nazis thing one step ahead, they managed to light, to make a menorah out of a potato. And every year he lights it in, in, in remembrance that his family never gave up on the mitzvahs. They did whatever they could. And then the fellow made a video, became viral. You know, that was, uh, you know, so... If the best one can do under circumstances is carving out a potato, then so be it. You know, if the best that one can have is a nice silver thing, that's that's good. But even having a nice silver thing, though, you can't be um, you can't go over the top. You know, uh, I went to to Israel for my my nephew's wedding um, over a year ago, and uh, my father was there. And we went to one of these silver stores in, in, in Jerusalem. And they had some very nice things. But then they had this matching menorah and candlesticks. It was just so over the top, it was gross. I mean, it didn't even have a price. right? So there were things that had a price, $40,000. right? They had a price. But this menorah and candlesticks didn't even have a price on it. That was, they were just, it was, it was so gaudy and over the top. And, uh, you know, if someone has that kind of money, please buy a nice menorah and you can support five families. You know, it's like, uh, but, um, you know, so I said to my father, the louder voice, you know, I said, oh, do you think we should get both of these? 
and all the salesmen got excited. <laughs> then we walked out. Anyway, we we we're just uh, you know, that's that's what happened. But but um, but a nice a nice manoir. So so the best that one can have. It's, um. All right. Now the leftover oil and wicks. The leftover oil and wicks they've been used for a mitzvah, and therefore they can't go in the garbage. So afterwards, if there's little bits of leftover oil, so we're not talking about leftover in the bottle, if you pour from the bottle. That's not leftover. It was never used for the mitzvah. We mean in the menorah itself. So um, it shouldn't be thrown away because it's used for a mitzvah. So either there's different things that people do with it. Some people burn it. Some people you know, triple wrap it, whatever it is. In, in our family, what we do is we, we set it aside. We collect it. We set it aside. And... Um, when we make the fire for to burn the chametz on Pesach, we use it these oily wicks and and, and leftover oil to um to to uh, help that fire. So it's used goes from one mitzvah to another mitzvah. So just one moment. Okay, sorry about that. So um it's that likewise the leftover lulav the left leftover lulav, right? So again it was used for a mitzvah, you shouldn't just throw it away. So again we keep it and by the time it comes Pesach time six months later, it's quite quite dry. And so uh whatever you say we normally use coals or something for to burn the hummus, but you put the few uh lulav branches dried out on top of it, some oily wicks and leftover oil and all of the sudden all of the sudden you know it's uh it helps helps light it nicely okay rabbi what about the s drug how what do you do how do you what do you do with that uh honestly every year we let it dry out and then we try and plant the seeds okay. and we get some sprouts and then it dies all right <laughs> We were Thank never you. successful. Never successful with it. Okay. Thank you. The dream is to grow the estrog tree. You could you could do that. Some people like uh some people make uh jelly out of it, make jelly out of it, and they eat it on Tubishvat on the new year of the of the tr the fruit trees. That's a nice thing uh to do. Use it for pisamim. Yeah, some people yeah, they, they use it for pisam because it smells nice. It's uh lots lots of things used for, but it just shouldn't be thrown in the in the garbage. Something's been used for a mitzvah. And if one has to throw something in the garbage that was used for a mitzvah, they should they should double wrap it. So it's not actually, you know, going directly into the garbage. Okay. Anyway. Uh that's the leftovers. So where do you put the manoira? So in the ideal world, you should put it on at, at your front door. The problem is, in most places, I don't know about where you live, but where I live, if you put your uh, silver menorah at the front door and you blink, it somehow grows legs and runs away. So, uh, not always putting the front door is, uh, is the best idea. So, people normally put it at a window or they put an interior door and they, um, they, uh, once it's in, a, if it's in a doorway, you should put it opposite the the mezuzah. So that way your whole doorway is surrounded by mitzvahs. You've got a mezuzah on one side and a menorah on the other side. Um, ideally, it should go on a low table. Um, but you know, it depends. <laughs> We, we, we've never really done that because we always had little kids in the house. And once the little kids got a bit bigger, then we started having grandkids in the house. So so uh, having it too low is, uh, also uh, doesn't work practically. But again, if you can, that, that's, 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 that's a nice, nice thing. Um, when... Sorry, one second. Sorry about that. All right. Now, um, if you've got a lot of people lighting in one house, so you've got a few, uh, let's say, boys who are lighting, they can't put them all in the one place right next to each other. 
has to be a bit of a gap because if they're all too close to each other, it's not recognizable which night of Hanukkah it is. So let's say, you know, it's it's the second night and four people light the menorahs right next to each other. You've got all these candles. You can't tell it's the second night of Hanukkah. So there has to be a bit of space in between them or different heights or or something, something to um, that, that you can tell, uh, you know, which night. Uh, it's good, you know, if a person is sleeping somewhere and they're eating somewhere else. I don't know, college, uh, I don't know, I don't know maybe not a good idea, but you know, Shiva dormitory. It's good, it's good, good to light where you uh, where you eat is the main place. All right, so when do you light now, except for Friday? I'm not talking about Friday now. Because there you have to light before you light Shabbos candles, otherwise it's it's uh, we're going to be in the, can't light on Shabbos. But every other day, the other days of Hanukkah, ideally we should light after sunset, sometime between sunset and nightfall, and then it um, keeps burning through till after nightfall, till after the stars come out, and goes half an hour after after that. That's that's the uh, that's the idea. Uh, the latest time to light, right? The latest time to light is while well, there's still some people awake. So it used to be in the old days, you know, they didn't have street lights, no one house lights. So uh, an hour or so after dark, that was it. Everyone was in bed and there was no one in the streets, no one at home, and a person was stuck. Now, today, many big cities, you could light two o'clock in the morning and there's still people, cars going past and different things. If you're on a main road, uh, you know, so it's, it's as long as there's either someone in the household awake, someone else in the household, or there's people out in the street. And that's going to change, you know, depending where you live and where you are, right? Because we part of the idea is to publicize the miracle. So it's meant to be lit where other people can see. Um, so how do we light? So as we said, one day, first day, one candle and two. So we place the candles in the menorah right to left. So they move, the first candle goes on the right, and then next one moves one position to the left, one position to the left. But when it comes to lighting, we light the new candle first. The new candle gets lit first. So we end up lighting left to right. So when I say we set it right to left and light, left the right that gets confusing so the simpler way to remember it is we place it right start on the right and move across and always like the new one first that is the plan okay um so we light the shamash, the servant candle, or whatever we're going to light the menorah with. And uh, then we say the brochas. So there's either two or three brochas. On, on every night, there's two. We say a brocha on, um, on the mitzvah to light. And then a brocha to thank Hashem for the miracles. And the first time we light, which hopefully is the first night, but the first time it's lit that year, we also say Sheikh Yano, the blessing that to thank Hashem for keeping us alive that we come to this time of the year again. Rabbi, I have a question. Yeah. You said uh you put the 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 first one to the right of the previous one. Is that with you facing? Yeah, no, or... so we so we put on the right. And then we start moving left. So the first candle's on the on the right end with you facing the menorah. Okay. So when when somebody outside sees it, he's actually seeing the lights on the left. Um yeah, I guess so. If the yeah, if you put in a windowsill, then that would be correct. If you're lighting at your front door, then you would put it against the door frame. 
well, not right against the door frame, catch a lot, but in the same front of the door frame, and you would light it from the same perspective as the people going past. Right. And so you see this in Jerusalem, for example. Like you see a lot of houses, they, they attach little glass containers like little fish tanks, yes. they look like, yes. next next to the, on, on their houses. And uh, and they light the menorah in that, right? So it's protected, so it doesn't blow out. And it's in the front, you know, the front door. And uh, so they're seeing it from the same perspective as, as the people on the outside are seeing it. But regardless of the of the viewer's perspective, you you light on your from your perspective. Okay, and then after we've lit it, we say Hanayus Halalu. It's a uh, uh, beautiful prayer about um, the candles and and how special yeah. they are and the only use for a mitzvah. And then then after that, many people have all kinds of customs that they say. Everyone says Hanayus Halalu pretty much, and some people sing Malso. Uh, there's Different people have customs, say certain chapters of Tillam, um, whatever one's custom is. But again, at the end of the day, if a person doesn't know, doesn't know Hanayu Salolo, they're not able to read it, the lighting is the main thing. So a person shouldn't put off the lighting because that they, they, they don't know uh, the, the other things. Okay. So as we said, we can't have any personal benefit. From the uh, from the from the menorah. Um, now, Friday, it's Shabbos, so we can't light after sunset because Shabbos begins at sunset. So what do we do? So on Shabbos we light before the Shabbos candles. So on Friday we're lighting before the Shabbos candles. So it's quite a bit earlier. Now the earliest time that we're allowed to light. Is a period called Plag HaMincha. Plag HaMincha is if we took the daylight time. And again, this is going to change whatever place you are, but essentially from sunrise to sunset. Three quarters through that period of time, that's called Plag HaMincha. And that's already now with three quarters through the daylight time. We can start saying that's evening. And that's the earliest time one could, could light. So... In America or Northern Hemisphere in general, it's not such an issue because you uh, Shabbos is coming so early this time of year. You know, well, you're not you're not you're not going to light much earlier than you have to. You're going to just light just before candle lighting. Let's say in Australia where it's the summer and uh, candle lighting maybe is nine thirty or nine o'clock in some places, and you want to uh, people bring Shabbos early, so you really have to uh, fill it up. You know, I used to use on Friday these big cups, you know, like they used to put the uh, certain Shabbos candles in. Anyway, but sometimes you have to go for a few hours, three hours. You have to keep it in order for it to be able to go half an hour after nightfall. But the main thing is to light before Shabbos candles because you want to light before you bring in Shabbos. And on Saturday night, on Matzah Shabbos, we light after Havdalah. Because we need to finish Shabbos first. Okay. So we don't say Tachnun. You know, we mentioned that we say Alanism and we add the Halal. But we don't say Tachnun. Tachnun are all the parts of davening where we're, we're admitting that we made mistakes and asking Hashem to forgive us. and Because... We don't say on joyous days because on joyous days, you know, it, it it's a bit depressing. So we 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 skip it. We read the Torah every day of Hanukkah, and what's interesting is that there is at least one Shabbos in Hanukkah, in which case you would take out two Torah scrolls, one for the weekly Pasha, and the second one for um, uh, the Hanukkah reading. There's always there's also a Rosh Chodesh in in um, the, the new month beginning during Hanukkah. So again, we take out two Torah scrolls, one for the Rosh Chodesh reading, first day of the Jewish month, and for Hanukkah. And if the Rosh Chodesh happens to fall on a Shabbos, I don't believe that's this year. I didn't really look in the calendar, 
but it was uh, a few years ago. It's one of the few times you take out three Torah scrolls. Three Torah scrolls. Well, we, well, we read the, the Pasha, the weekly Pasha, then the Rosh Chodesh, and then the Hanukkah. So it's uh, a very, very special time. When you take out three Torah scrolls, is there's incredible uh, blessings available. So it's not this year, but, but it can... Uh, it happens. So various customs. Now we've done the laws. So various customs. There's a custom to tell over the story of Hanukkah and the and the uh, miracles. And there's plenty of good recordings you can get and good books if you're not sure. Uh, there's a custom to, as we said, to eat some dairy food and some cheese. Those are the, the story that happened. As we said, the women don't do malacha. There's a custom to give out Hanukkah guilt, right? To give out uh, money. Uh, to, to children, you to your children, your relatives. Um, children should be taught to give some sadaka from that. Um, we play with the dreidel, right? The sivivon, the the spinner. So on a simple level, is because when the study of Torah was banned, they would uh, go out in fields and hide in various places and learn. And if any soldiers came by, they quickly hid the scrolls and they took out the spinning tops. And they made it like there was some gambling going on, you know. So, because gambling was good for the Greeks, but starting Torah, you know, God forbid, you know, that was, uh, they, didn't, they didn't mind that. So, that's on a simple level, but also Kabbalistically, it it uh, has great significance as well. Um, it's a time where we should try and increase in our study of Torah and doing mitzvahs either in quality or quantity. So maybe you're not taking on more things, maybe you're doing it better. Um, this is when Hashem gave it back. Gave back our freedom for, to do the Torah mitzvahs, and so we need to try and uh, take advantage of it. There's a custom to give extra sadaka on Hanukkah. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. That's Hanukkah in a nutshell. Any questions? Rabbi, you were mentioning about the things with silver and Kabbalah. Can you just yeah. elaborate on that a little bit? Okay, so my my the reason yeah. I'm asking is yeah. my grand my granddaughter is turning three years old this week. Okay, and you're gonna get a little candlesticks. Yeah, so we, so we bought it. candles. Yeah, we bought candlesticks, silver okay. candlesticks. So I'm gonna tell you the uh, the the oversimplified version, right? The the the. Uh, because really, we should do. A sh if anything, we would need at least one shear on its own. But in in very short, oversimplification. So the word kesef, which means uh, silver, shares the root with the word of nichsav, means to, like a a spiritual desire. So that's that's an oversimplification of the main reason. So it's, the the word itself, and the Hebrew words are, are not just the words. Are, Names are something Hebrew is not a not a random name. It means it's 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 the Hebrew letters are representative of the godly creative energies. So when something has a name, it's not just a, a name tag like in English. You know, in English you have a table and a chair. If we wanted to, if we all agreed, we'll switch it. We'll call a table a chair and a chair a table, and it doesn't make any difference because it's just an identi uh, you know identification tag. So we know what we're talking about. But in Hebrew, the name of something actually represents its spiritual source. So uh, the word for silver, which is a spiritual source, has has the same letters. So in other words, it's a similar creative energy as a godly desire. So uh, we we want to bring, we want to invest in this godly desire in our myth, in our misses and everything that we do. So that, that's that's an oversimplification of the main reason. But maybe, uh, maybe one day when we have a special topic or something, we'll uh, we'll we'll go into more depth. All right. Any anything with the uh, gematria of uh, one seventy, Kesef? I don't know. Gematria could be. I'm not sure, but that's that, that might be another connection, but it's not the Kabbalistic connection. It's uh, you know. Gematri is also so people uh, you know each Hebrew letter has a numerical value, and the uh, the the that also significant because again there's nothing's coincidental, 
And just as a total side point, just since we mentioned Gematria and it was yesterday in the half Torah, in the the reading of the prophets, there's there's a verse about um you know if you fly up to the to the stars like an eagle, I'm, Hashem says I'm gonna throw you down. So it's actually talking about the eight Sahara, you know, like you can become uh doesn't mean literally flying to the stars, it means like uh becoming conceited. You know, if you're so conceited you'll be thrown down. That's 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 the meaning of the verse. But but the wording used if you if you throw up fly up to the stars so you know the the uh the space shuttle that crashed, that verse has the numerical value of the date. And you know the eagle was the symbol, you know. I don't want to necessarily say it is connected, but it was interesting. If if it is a coincidence, it's certainly an interesting coincidence. But that's uh, that's anyway. All right. So in that case, we can go on with our usual topic, unless we have any other Hanukkah questions. And just uh, one other thing just to mention about the Hanukkah, not only will I, I, I neglected to mention, not only did these farmers fight against a an army that was highly trained and armored and well armed, the Greeks also had elephants, war elephants, right? So it was like tanks. So it's like you got foot soldiers against tanks. Now these uh, armored and trained uh, war elephants. So it was another, you know, just to show the the, the victory was. Purely miraculous, uh, as you would say, most of our wars are miraculous. You know, you have, uh, you have, um, you know, in, in what's the name of the famous, uh, the famous uh, military college in America? West Point. Yes, West Point. That's it. Let's see, us Australians aren't, aren't as familiar. Sorry, we heard of it. I forgot the name. So they. I, the truth is, I don't know if it's true. I was never there, but they they say when they study all various ancient wars, but they don't really study the wars from from Chumash from from the Torah. And uh, they so, so, so a Jewish officer asked once the uh, the person in charge, you know, why, why? says because all, all these wars are they're miraculous. You know, you, you you can't copy it. You know, you just can't. You know, it's uh, so there's there's a recognition. Rabbi, right. yes. Uh, I uh, was looking for a poem for somebody. I was writing a poem for somebody for Hanukkah once, and it, I came across that the United States War College, somebody had done a graduate uh, uh, paper on this, and they said that the difference between the victory of the Maccabees and the defeat of the uh, revolts against the Romans uh, was basically that during the time of the Romans, there was unfortunately between the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees and the uh, the ones who were traitors with the Romans, there was a lack of unity. Whereas in the time of the Maccabees, the entire society, the religious, the nationalists, everybody, uh, 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 the farmers, everybody, the higher ups, all were united against the religious persecution of, of yeah. the Greek. Yeah, and they so said that was the major difference. It it it, it was. I'm just gonna and I'm just gonna change it slightly. I mean in, in Hanukkah wasn't total union that the Hellenists, the, the Greek Hellenists fought on the side of the Greeks. Oh they did. And so so as much as much as it was a war against the Greeks, it was also a bit of a civil war. And um and actually so the, but all those who fought for the Jewish way of life were united. Well, in the second base of is correct. That's a point, you know, they they were in side Jerusalem, for example. This is the the I mean it's just shocking tragedy. They're inside there, they had enough uh food, water, oil, wood, you know, supplies to last over twenty years. And the walls were pretty much, you know, they couldn't penetrate the walls. So you would have to sit there and have a siege for 20 odd years. And who's going to do that? But inside, there were um, 
So the Sadducees were pretty much sided with the Romans, but you had inside the walls, although there were, there were some Sadducees as well, and they were fighting on behalf of the Romans. And you had of the in the Jews, you had three groups, right? You had you had uh, you had the Zealots, for lack of a better translation, who yes, were so. yeah, in, in, insisting that we go out to fight the mainstream, you know. The Orthodox Jews, who were called Purushim, because they separated themselves from the the rest, which is being translated into Greek as Pharisees, but that's that's the Orthodox Jews. And uh, and you had this, you had three factions essentially fighting inside, and they were, and what ended up happening was this faction that wanted to fight the Greeks at all cost, the Romans at all cost, burnt all the food and supplies. Oh my lord. Which this caused a famine inside, and to eventually got a point where two things happened: they had to go out to fight to, to just even get anything, but also meant the defenders on the walls couldn't defend the walls properly because of weakness, and that's yeah. how the 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 Romans were able to break through into the walls. So, um, so by Hanukkah, said it's not one hundred percent true that all the Jews on the one side there were some Jews who fought with the Greeks, but all the Jews who were fighting for Judaism were united. That's that's most definitely so, and I, I put it to say, and so I'll do one second. I put to say, I think one of the, it's very easy to look at twenty twenty hindsight, and be a know it all, right? So I'm not blaming anyone, but probably the biggest mistake that the the Maccabees did when they when they won was that they left all the government structure in place, and these were run by Hellenists, and these are the ones that ended up becoming a. Uh, the Sadducees and and the Roman sympathizers and and really caused a lot of problems in the future. You know that whole. Uh, I hate you know, to this... say this is like what's happening now. Unfortunately, you had the highest echelon in the in the Israeli military refusing all the reports, all the information yeah. that was good information regarding the coming invasion by yeah. the Hamas, and and yeah. it was totally ignored, and they didn't send it to the to the highest yeah. echelon, and uh, because there yeah. were too many high officers who were Bogdanim, they were simply traitors. Yeah, Unfortun they, unfortunately, we saw a terrible lack of unity beforehand, and there were even people throwing around the word, word civil war on different things, and and uh, it's unfortunate that it takes a tragedy to create Jewish unity. And uh, hopefully, after this is all over, Rather than trying to uh, poke the finger at everyone and and take down one's opponent, people will be able to hold on to this sense of unity, which is so essential for Jewish survival. Never mind Jewish, uh, to, to you know, to to flourish. We haven't got our hostages back yet. No, no, I haven't got them all back, and uh, you know, I'm just, God willing, you know, it's uh, Corbinot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm praying to God Almighty that we'll see a miracle and that the so will, blind will. status will 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 yeah. uh, give forth the people that uh, they still uh, may be holding. Amen. Yeah, David. Yeah, you were saying about the the military college West Point. Yeah. So there's actually two military colleges. One is the military, which is West Point. And one is the Navy, the Naval College, the Naval Academy, which is almost equal to importance to the to West Point. You know what that's called? It's called by the name. It sounds like, like just like the place where Rabzusha came from. It's called Annapolis. Okay. Ex exactly, Annapolis, like a Rabzusha of Annapoli. Yeah, but they it's don't fight on the ground. Right. But yeah, but uh, they they fight. So you got to have both places to be able to fight. But the whole point is that uh, they're from Annapolis, which is uh, uh, almost like a, a holy name to a certain That's extent. It. Yeah, My, I have a son too. He wants to buy a farm and call it Annapoli Farms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a friend of mine in Toronto, and he had twins. This is like um, forty years ago. He had twins. And he named he named the Reb Zusha and he named Zusha and Eli Melech. Okay. And what about the third brother, Moshe? 
Yeah, I don't know about that, that one. That didn't have cake. Anyway, I wish everyone a wonderful week. A incredibly fulfilling and meaningful Hanukkah that should really truly light up their lives spiritually. I I, I, you, I, I don't think we have class next week. So I wish everyone a good Shabbos for two weeks this week and next Rabbi, week. Yes. You, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is tonight the um, the um, we're, there's going to be a Fabregan in, in, on behalf of the um, release of the Rebbe from prison? It depends where you are. Like it could have been last night. It could be tonight. Yeah. Okay, well, here in Florida, for example, would be yeah. would be yeah. I see. So they'll they'll, they'll be they'll be for Bregans all throughout yeah, the. It'll be a good good thing to attend if you can. Moshe, yes, where absolutely. are you? Well, I'm I'm also I'm in the North Miami also. Ah. There was something last night in North, North Miami, Miami Beach. Beach. They had something. Um, Base Menachem over here. I wish everyone a truly illuminating Hanukkah. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. 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 Rabbi, I think next week we, we do we may still have class. It's the following week for that. Okay. David, are you still yes. there? Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask you because the place where I read this this paper from it it was called the U.S. War College. Is that associated with West Point? Do you happen to know? I think so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I present to everybody. Happy Hanukkah. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Bye bye. Let's press in these. Он говорил о том, что там было где немножко не помню. А то, что я тебе рассказывала, что я об этом читала, помнишь? Что в Иерусалиме, когда Романс должны были атаковать.